Welcome to episode four with Senator Bob Smith. We appreciate each and every one of you for following along with the Baron 52 MIA mystery. During these episodes, we have made reference to documents important to Sergeant Machoff's case. Putting together the recorded episodes, I'm not able to insert the documents on the screens for you to read. Many documents are a few pages long and we wanna be sure you have access to them. So you might review the evidence we present and form your own opinion of what is presented. In each of these episodes in the description below, I have included a link where you can view the, each document that was referenced in the show. Again, we want to thank you all for following this story and giving us your support. So without further ado, let's dive into this episode. He just turned 20 when his chopper went down. He searched for survival. So today I'm thrilled to have with me today a distinguished guest who played a key role in one of America's most controversial and emotionally charged issues in American history. Joining us today is Senator Robert Smith, who served as a vice chairman of the Senate Select Committee on POWMIA Affairs in the early 1990s. The committee was tasked with investigating the issue of American service members who were missing in action or were prisoners of war during the Vietnam War. Senator Smith played a vital role in this investigation and the committee's findings continue to be a subject of debate and controversy to this day. Today, we're speaking with Senator Smith about the committee's work, its findings, and ongoing efforts to bring closure to this issue. Senator Smith, thank you so much for joining us today. My honor, glad to be here. So I'll just kick it off. On, um, during the Senate Select Committee on POWMIA Affairs, witnesses for the Defense Intelligence Agency and the uh, National Security Agency testified that they had received intelligence indicating there may have been a small number of American service members who were not repatriated at the end of the Vietnam War. The, the committee's final report issued in 93 did acknowledge that there were some evidence suggesting that live Americans may have been left behind, but the committee concluded that it did not have enough information to reach a de definite conclusion. The committee also found no evidence to support the claim that large numbers of Americans were still being held captive in Southeast Asia. Senator Smith, can you describe for us the process that the, that the committee went through to investigate the issue of the POWMIAs from the Vietnam War? Uh, surely. Uh, I think uh, just be before uh, going into that, uh, I just want to say that one of the handicaps that we had was something that I had no control over was, uh, were two things. One was cost, the cost of the committee. We had a certain budget, we couldn't exceed it. So we weren't allowed to, to do some things that I would have liked to have done. Um, and then the time limit, we were time, we had to wrap it up. And that put a lot of pressure on us to uh, get information that we really didn't have time to get. We had to short circuit some information and other times we, uh, we, we couldn't even go into, into it, especially uh, from the Korean War and a lot of information 
Uh, Heather, you'll recall, we'll get into that, that letter that I sent to Senator Kerry, which indicated a whole lot of things that were not, we weren't able to accomplish. But in terms of your question, John, uh, it was pretty extensive, as extensive as we could possibly be. I mean, it ranged from field trips, if you will, or trips to Vietnam. Uh, the, the committee, when I say the committee, somebody, either myself or Kerry, or usually Kerry and I went together, or other members of the committee traveled to Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, Vietnam, Russia, um, not to mention uh, numerous meetings with government officials, private citizens in those states, in those countries, and also uh, meeting with countless numbers of people in our government, in addition to family members like John and others uh, who were constantly talking to my office about trying to extract information from the government, their own government, who wouldn't provide it. So we, we did that. Uh, we also had uh, depositions uh, formal depositions, private conversations, secret meetings, people who didn't want to be identified, who remained anonymous, those who uh, who uh, couldn't testify or wouldn't, uh, one being a Secret Service agent. So it was a it was a it was an extensive process, uh, but not long enough. I mean, I understand that there's a limit to what you can spend, and I understand there has to be a time limit, but the sunsetting provision clearly restricted us. And I would just conclude on this point. I think all of you here are insiders and you know what I went through with Senator Kerry and Senator McCain. It was basically, uh, it wasn't Republican Democrat. It was about those who felt that we needed to normalize uh, relations with Vietnam and then establish diplomatic relations regardless. And the POW issue was in the way uh, that was the Kerry McCain side, and there was my side, and a few other members like Chuck Grassley and Hank Brown and a few others who felt that we really needed to get the truth uh, about what happened to our men. And that was my goal. And my only goal was to find out what happened uh, to our men. And uh, uh, so that was my motive. But unfortunately, uh, I was stymied on numerous occasions by Senator Kerry and Senator McCain, I guess you would say the, the majority, so to speak. I could, not, I could not control the meetings because Senator Kerry was, the Democrats were in the Senate, were in the majority. And so he had the chairmanship and I had the vice chairmanship. So I was restricted in what I could do in terms of calling witnesses. Uh, I, although I will say in conclusion, Senator Kerry was very fair to me. He, he allowed me to get most of the witnesses I wanted, but there were times when we were cut short, evidence was destroyed, and we can get into that later. Uh, all kinds of bad things happened. But anyway, that's that's pretty much the, what we were up against, what we tried to do. Our goal was to yeah, find the truth, period. Wherever it went, uh, we wanted to find it. And if we could get all the information that was available to get, our government as well as from the Vietnamese government and other governments who may have been involved, like the Russians, if we could get that, then we could go ahead and move on with diplomatic relations, but not before. So what were some of the significant findings the committees, of the committee's investigation into the issue? What, what were some of, the, some of the key findings that you had? Well, the, the, I, the big, one of the big ones was the, the so-called cluster uh, issue where the, we had a pro very professional staff of some of them former uh, officials in the DIA and, and other prominent people who knew what they were doing, who investigated these sightings. And so we had them clustered on maps uh, so that uh, we could see uh, in, in, a, in a congregated form all, where all these sightings were. And when you, you get a, you know, you'd get 4,000 sightings across the board over all these years after the war, and then you begin to put them together and you see that they fit into a cluster, that they were seen several times by different people in the same location. And so that was a very significant finding in my view. Uh, sometimes it was Garwood, sometimes they were, uh, people were making it up and sometimes I, I felt uh, they, were, they were valid. So that was one very significant finding that there was a tremendous cluster uh, 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 that you could see all around the Vietnam where these sightings took place. Uh, but I, I think the one significant finding that I, uh, there, there's so many, but 
I call it the high bar issue, which every time you would get a certain amount of information to establish so-called evidence of live sightings, uh, they would, the government, our government would raise the high bar and say, well, that's not enough. You know, uh, it's like, uh, John, in, in the case of, um, of your brother, uh, and the Baron 52, you know, we, you saw in that testimony, uh, that, um, when we were, when I was questioning the spot, he was putting words in my mouth saying, I was saying this and saying that when I wasn't, but you know, they initially said that they had, um, reports you know, these, uh, these, these reports uh, of uh, traffic saying that there were POWs being moved. And of course, that didn't come out until after we challenged them to bring it out. And then it, it went all the way to Kissinger, who was negotiating with the North Vietnamese at, uh, at the Paris Peace Accords. So if they didn't think it was important, why the hell did it go all the way to Kissinger's level? So these are the kinds of things when I say high bar, no matter what happens, uh, then you know that Mooney was it was didn't know what he was doing. Whatever, instead of trying to seek out and and substantiate things, they tried to debunk it and and drill it down and make it as hard as possible for the families and the committee to, to get the answers. Uh, so that's that was a finding that frustrated me that we were lied to over and over. And that was one of the letters Heather, that you sent me mm -hmm. uh, where uh, I pointed that out to uh, Janet Reno that we were lied to under oath uh, and I proved it. I had to prove uh, that was a significant finding. I also had several, which I'd love to go into, but I don't want to monopolize the conversation, but I, we can, That's at okay. some point, I'd like to go into the Garwood situation. I'd like to go into the, to the uh, somewhat into the Baron 52 and also, uh, and I know that's your main focus, and also the um, the pilot identifier uh, code that is a very dramatic story that I don't think the public knows because yeah. we couldn't get it all out. Uh, but just final point to give you an idea of what I was up against, I wanted to bring Bobby Garwood in to testify about what he claimed to have seen while being over there for six years after the war was over, from 1973 to 79. And John McCain said he would, quote, unquote, destroy the SOP if you bring him in. Uh, and so Bobby was having some stability issues, you know, psychiatric issues. So I didn't want to put him through that. But we had numerous conversations with Bobby Garwood, with his attorney uh, and with him. And I believe Bobby Garwood. I believe he was telling the truth about what he saw. And then we, of course, went over there in Vietnam. I did. Uh, and visited Tok Ba Lake on one of his sightings, saw the island, saw the prison camp, saw the generator that he mm -hmm. claimed to repair, that the DIA said he didn't repair, and so forth and so forth. I could go on and on. But. Mm -hmm. so anyway, as far as findings, um, it's, it's you know, it, we found that we were lied to. Uh, we found that uh, there was a lot of evidence that uh, we didn't even get into. Uh, there were a lot of eyewitnesses. There were a lot of live sighting reports. Uh, we certainly found out that the Vietnamese were not forthcoming uh, and they got their diplomatic relations without ever having to be forthcoming. Um, and that, that was very troubling. Yeah, one of the interesting things that you brought up there is how it went that, that the issue with Baron 52 rising to the level of, of Kissinger. Um, I located a CIA uh, presidential daily brief document that was 16 months later after the shoot down where. Uh, the, the CIA was briefing the president of the United States on Mc, uh, of uh, K, uh, McKay or K that was shot down in Laos in May May of uh, seventy three, and then also the four that were prior to the ceasefire. So the president of the United States was actually being briefed like, over a year later about the four from Baron fifty two. Yeah, and it, it's it's very obvious, and I know John Majoff, you know more than I do about this, but. Uh, it's very obvious that that was a very troubling incident in and of itself and that it was an embarrassing incident because we were in Paris negotiating. We were, I think we already had a schedule uh, set for the first tranche of POWs to come home. I'm pretty sure of that, that there was a date set. And then this plane goes down uh, and uh, it's, it was an embarrassment to the U.S. government. And so what 
what Kissinger would have been concerned about was here I am sitting here trying to negotiate to find out, get the list, if you will, of POWs that we're that the Vietnamese are going to turn over to us and tell me tell us how many they have. We may have four more. Uh, and this is an embarrassment. And so um, that went right to that's why it went right to Kissinger that when that traffic came in, the the the, the uh, signal signal intelligence. Radio signals. Yeah. And when they when that came in, that was that, that that sent shockwaves through the system. They didn't know for sure. Yeah, they saw four bodies. They got they knew they had four bodies. They did not know what happened to the other four, including your brother John. And so that was that was shot right to the top, right right up there because Kissinger was there. He was in Paris or was going, and he had to have that information. They couldn't keep that from him uh, because he would have would have wanted to, he would have first thing he would have done was say, can you add these four guys to the list? If they're alive, and so that had to go up there. And believe me, they would not have sent that to Henry Kissinger that high up. Maybe even Nixon. I don't know for a fact. That's another story into why we couldn't get access to that. But but they, they had they would sent that up there. They certainly wouldn't have done that if they didn't think it was accurate. At least at the time. Well, Dr. Shields the other day uh, told us that he that it did go to Nixon, and and he he said that directly. And I believe him. Uh, I believe yeah. him because I don't think Kissinger could feel comfortable going over and negotiating with the North Vietnamese on prisoners, prisoner lists, uh, knowing that there might be four more guys that just got captured when they weren't even supposed to be flying at the time because the, the, the accords were uh, you know, being signed. They should not have been flying. Uh, and they got, unfortunately, and the guys were doing their job, but it was the idea, idea of sending them over there when the Paris Peace Accords were being negotiated. So it was an embarrassment. It was awkward. And they didn't know what to do about it. And they didn't know what the truth was. And in, as I pointed out in the committee, in the we had two rounds with the Stott on this and the DIA. They should have said, look, if they had come in and to the committee and say, look, ladies and gentlemen on the committee, if... If uh, we we went to the site, we saw four bodies. We don't know what happened to the other four. We had radio traffic uh, that said that there were pilots being moved or or pirates, whatever you want to call them. But they didn't tell them that. We had to extract that from them bit by bit by bit by bit. And yet they felt enough, and I pointed this out in the committee, they felt strongly enough that they weren't going to sit on it. They bucked it all the way up. They ran Mooney into the ground, but they took Mooney's stuff and sent it all the way up to Nixon. So yep. believe me, they thought it was real. And whether it was or whether it was not, I don't know the answer. But we should have known the answer uh, before we settled uh, on that issue. We could have taken, gone to the North Vietnamese and said, look, we lost a plane. We only found four. Where are the other four? Do you guys have them if you know? If you have them, we want them with with the rest of the guys. That was not done. I'm just listening intently because I feel that uh, uh, there are people who have not been interviewed on the matter, uh, and one of them being Dr. Kissinger, which I think we would know the end result of that interview if it did take place. So, uh, yeah, uh, that, John, is, a, is an issue in and of itself. We tried, and, and uh, Heather, the letter that I that you asked, that you sent me, uh, pointed that out, where we I had asked, in a, in a letter to Kerry, just as the committee was closing down, before we closed it, if we could conduct an interview with all the living ex-presidents uh, because who were dealing with this issue. You know, Reagan did, Ford did, um, Nixon. Uh, and uh, and so we wanted to meet with them. Clinton, well, Clinton was not in at the time, but but we couldn't, we couldn't get, we couldn't get that meeting. And then we tried to get Kissinger uh, uh, to come and testify, but we couldn't get him. Uh, and we did get some depositions from Mel Laird, who said we left guys. So we, we really don't know. Uh, we really we really never got the, the, these people to talk. But I, I think what it tells me, it's a major story in and of itself that the presidents, if, uh, we'll give the presidents a buy on it maybe, but at Kissinger's level, Kissinger, and others who refuse to talk, that is is a big issue in of itself. And, in, 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 you know, deference to the families and all they've endured and the men who, who fought and died and those who came home wounded and those who came home as POWs, those people deserved 
to have Henry Kissinger come up there and say, whether it's about the Baron 52 or other POW issue in general, and say, here's what happened. Here's, here's what we got. Here's what we didn't get. He never did that. And that, that to me is unforgivable. Why, why do you think it is in your last statement before that question, you talked about, you know, that we knew there were four that didn't, that we had no evidence out of the search and rescue. Why do, was it just purely for embarrassment and, and Watergate and all of the things that were kind of coming down on them? Do you have any other thoughts on why Kissinger, because obviously Watergate really, you know, wasn't Kissinger. He wasn't involved in Watergate. Um, why he didn't press harder for those four. I've, I've tried to answer that question. On one of my trips to Vietnam, uh, and I, I can't remember the name of the Vietnamese official I met with. We met with a lot of top level Vietnamese officials. I did I, oftentimes without Kerry because he didn't seem to be interested, but I would go off on my own and talk to some of these Vietnamese officials. And I, I think the guy's name is Phan, but I could be wrong on that. So I don't want to say for sure. But in a conversation I had with a Vietnamese official who was right at the table with Henry Kissinger, he told me, he said, I sat right across the table from Henry Kissinger. I was one of the men, several Vietnamese officials who sat across the table from Kissinger. And he said, and I'll, I'll, I'll paraphrase him. I hate to say it, but he said, I don't recall Kissinger pushing hard or anybody on the U.S. side pushing hard for answers on the POWs. And I said, well, that's, I find that hard to believe, uh, sir. What, can you explain it? And he said to me, well, we provided a list. We had a list that, of a list of POWs that we said we have. They took it, they being our side, took our list. They gave us their list. And some names were on their list that weren't on ours and vice versa. Mm -hmm but they didn't go beyond that. They didn't say, well, wait a minute now, you captured, we have films of this guy being captured in this province on such and such a date. And we have eyewitness accounts to that effect. Uh, why can't we go into that? He said, they didn't go into it. They just accepted the list that was provided with, that, with very little, I don't wanna say no, but very little pushback or follow up on some of these cases. And as you know, we had guys come back that were not on the list and we had guys that didn't come back that were on the list. Mm -hmm. So I, I get the, I got the impression that if I could summarize it, that the POWs were taken for granted. They didn't feel that it was a priority. They thought that the, they took the word of the Vietnamese of what the list they had. And even though our list was much bigger, we had as many as 500 additional possible POWs, about 500 mm -hmm. less than they had. We had around 1,000, they had 500. And we, we took their list. Uh, and I don't think we, we challenged it sufficiently. We should have gone right down every list, every single person. We should have shown the facts we had and we should have done, you know, not, I'm not saying we had to do all that prior to the, to the other guys getting a release, but we should have had a process in place that as mm -hmm. these prisoners were being released, that we could, you know, that we could follow through. And the other thing that we were not allowed to do, uh, or didn't have time to do, and was we were objected to by Kerry, was to interview a lot of the returning POWs. Mm -hmm. So we could kind of collate, collate the information that they brought out and what they saw, what they didn't see in the prison system. Uh, everybody's, these reports were pretty much uh, private uh, to protect uh, some of the guys, you know, did some things that probably they wish they hadn't done. And I'm not condemning, com blaming, I'm not making any editorial comment on that. They, who knows what anybody would have done in that situation, but they didn't want that out. So they kept it private and the only, only the interrogators or those who spoke to the, the de debriefers rather than interrogators, yeah. only the debriefers were able to see and hear this hear these guys, and that didn't go from there. But I talked privately to uh, several POWs uh, who were very concerned about a second prison system that never that never came out, never really materialized in the intelligence answers that we asked for. You talked about Mooney. We talked about the message, you know, the intercept. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? They really discounted Mooney and, and what, his, what his thoughts were about... Uh, the translations and, and exactly what was going on. I look at that as this 
who was it, General Tai, said the mindset to debunk. I, you know, it, 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 you get a report uh, that says that, there, that pilots, you know, air, radio traffic saying pilots or pirates, whatever you want to call them, were being moved. Nobody said they were RVNs. Nobody said they were Americans. They said pilots or pirates. Now, they didn't know anything about it. when I questioned the Scott, he couldn't tell me about any other planes that were missing. He couldn't he, he couldn't give me any specifics about any other planes down in the area. Just that pirates may or may not have been moved to our vents. Well, we don't know that. Maybe it's true. It, it could very well be true. But the way we had to push and pull and tug to pull this information out of them, we get the rep- we, we get a report. They come in, they check the Baron 52 crash site. They come to the conclusion that there were four guys that uh, uh, eight guys died, even though they could only prove that four died. They said they were KIA. They should not have been KIA. They should have been MIA, as you know, John. And so then comes the radio traffic. And to me, if I'm if I'm in on the crash site and I'm the investigator, and I don't see four bodies. I only see four, not eight. Then I'm thinking, and then I hear this radio traffic. I'm thinking, whoa, wait a minute, what did I miss? And mm-hmm. and that's exactly what they did when they sent that message all the way up to Kissinger and maybe Nixon. They thought the same damn thing. They're not kidding. They're not fooling anybody. That's exactly what they thought. And then they came back uh, after the fact, years later, and come back with all this other gobbledygook about RV and Arvin, you know, maybe somebody from the North Vietnam, South Vietnamese pilots and whatever. That all came later. That was not on the time at the time it happened, and they could have resolved it and maybe made it a lot easier on your family over the years, John. Had they had they been more honest, maybe they did die, and maybe they did have information. I don't know, and 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 unfortunately, they handled it wrong. They could have found that out. They should have gone to the Vietnamese in Paris. Kissinger should have said, "Wait a minute, we just lost this aircraft. We found eight bodies." four bodies, excuse me. We don't know what happened to the other four. We want to investigate the site. We want you to tell us, you know what happened to them. Let's find out. Did they, were they captured? Did they die? Were their bodies? Let's settle it right now before we leave Paris. And that's what they should have done. They didn't do it. And so 20 years later, they put your family through all this misery all these years with doubts and you know hassling you and giving you a hard time as you're trying to pry out the information. Yeah, I'm going to insert that clip that the stunt was giving you at that time where it was a friend of a friend yeah is how he had put it mm-hmm. a friend of a friend of a helicopters friend. the assumption went, is that the only aircraft that were down the only the only p- potential candidates for this were the crew of the the uh uh ec-47 crew well there there in fact were were at least three arvin helicopters that were down in an area that would have caused the crew if captured to be evacuated through ving at the approximate time frame the, of of uh, this particular that we acquired this particular piece of intelligence, and in fact, a personal friend of mine, who was an uh, a, a, an air uh, a, a pilot in the Vietnamese Air Force, uh, is aware of a friend of his who was uh, the pilot of one of those helicopters. He is aware that that friend, in fact, was captured with his crew and was moved to North Vietnam. Now, we're in the process right now of trying to locate uh, to determine if. Uh, if any member of that crew uh, survived captivity and is here in the United States. And if I, know, I can find them, we may have an answer to who this message really refers to. But the point is, the point is, at the time you drew this conclusion, you didn't have that information. So what I'm saying is there is no other aircraft missing. We discussed the one that went down and the people were killed. There's no other aircraft missing in the area like this. What I, what I am trying to get at here is... You, is, is you get a radio message, you, the message is self-explanatory. That's what, what it says and what it says. Then you start doing analysis on it. That's, there's nothing about VIN in the message. There's nothing about VIN 240 miles away in the message. That's an analysis. That came later. The message itself speaks for itself. It says for... The initial message. You, you noted that the, uh, that the second version of that message contained a footnote. Uh, I'm... I, feel confident that the uh, the version uh, uh, that you have the version of the first version of that it. message I can't read it and uh, read and it, it also I contains am. a footnote and that that footnote from the people who issued the report said that it came from Vin I know in their judgment wouldn't it have been wouldn't it have been more honest to say to the committee when we asked you if there was evidence 
if anybody survived Baron 52 a few months ago when you testified, wouldn't it have been more honest to say we had a radio transmission? We didn't believe the radio transmission or whatever you you're, whatever you're at. But but we think we also examined the crash site and we found that we didn't have any, based on the people who are at the site. We don't think anybody survived. And here's why Sir, you didn't in, say that. You said there's in, no evidence Mr. Impl Scott. implicit implicit in your your statement is the assumption that that I don't believe this radio transmission. It's also implicit that I th that uh, that uh, there's confirmed evidence that uh, everybody else believed it. I believe that radio transmission. It simply does not relate in any way to the this particular incident it who, does not relate it, to this ec-47 crew it could possibly be could i don't know who it is but it could possibly be uh the the members the crew members of of one of those three arvin aircraft so we, we don't know what happened to them. that's the point we really don't know and i can't i mean to me to for you to say that there were other aircraft missing and you can't tell me who they are or how many people were on them uh, how many years later, 20 years later, you're telling me that there are other airport aircraft missing in that area. And it was within that 45 minute period that this message was reported. I mean, that's outrageous. Well, well, let, let me quote from the, uh, uh, a letter written by the commander on the spot as to whether or not there was indications that people had bailed out of that. This man was, was much closer to the scene than, 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 than I am, uh, from, from this location in time. I'd like to know who the aircrafts were. And I went in and I read the reports that are now declassified that uh, uh, the ones that he was trying to compare it to were a few weeks before the shoot down of Baron 52 and a few weeks after the shoot down of Baron 52. Let, let me, I, I want to, I want to, I'd like to hear from others and I don't want to monopolize, but I want to say one thing about the spot, which is related, but not directly to Baron 52. Later on in the hearing, I don't know if it was before the Baron 52 discussion or after, I can't recall. Um, there was a discussion and an exchange between Destat and myself about the Ho Chi Minh tomb and uh, about tunnels uh, under the Ho Chi Minh tomb. Is, is I, an underground, call it a facility, call it uh, whatever you want, uh, but there is something underground. Uh, we have an, an intelligence to that effect. It's been quoted. It's been cited uh, before, and so the bottom line is, and I and I'm, I'm not going to beat this thing to death, but both of you are simply wrong. Now, let me let me you you did quote, and I'm I'm going to I'm going to quote the quote that you left out, Mr. Destat, uh, frankly, um, in response to a question regarding that facility. You said on page 127 in the testimony, "quote I had freedom of movement throughout Hanoi." and the surrounding area. I am very aggressive in seeking out a wide variety of contacts formally and informally throughout the city. I traveled around the city every spare moment I had. One of the things that I've looked into is the possibility of an underground facility of some sort, and I can't find any evidence that there is even a basement in any building anywhere in that country. That's, that's the first quote. And that happens to be true. That is not true. That, uh, sir, that you, is you, not that is not true. I said that I have not found any evidence. And well, I'm that, telling you that that is not true. I'm telling you that your statement is not true. That there is something. Uh, he's saying he didn't find it. I'm. I'm that's fine. O other, other than what I, I I stated for the record in August, that we were aware of some air raid shelters there. That that we knew about, but, but that's not but what the, we were discussing. But, in my mind, we were discussing correct, facilities. All and Mr. Sido, you also Sido also said, as Mr. Destat has pointed out, that's not a closed or a denied area. Speaking of the the uh, mausoleum area, we have talked to people who walk through that area. There's no reporting that would corroborate the construction of any underground facility in this time period. Um, Mr. Destat. I might add that I've walked and ridden my bicycle down that street around the perimeter of the Citadel several times over the past 18 months. I've stopped and chatted with the guards at various entrances. I've chatted with people who work inside the compound. I've talked to civilians who run soup stands and other businesses. And I would say, looking at this issue in general, there are only a handful of reports which mention in one instance an under underground facility or in the other instance, the mausoleum. And again, uh, Mr. Cedo, if you would look at the map again, quoting you, you will see that the city of Hanoi has a very high water tape. One who has been in Hanoi half day's rain will find the water level covering the streets. 
To propose that there might be an underground facility in Hanoi means to propose that you have to have a water evacuation system that would entail a great deal of construction. Certainly something that we would have been aware of with the coverage that we've had of that area, and I don't consider this report probable. Now, I realize that you can pull out quotes out of context. Nothing is meant to pull out of context. The context of this debate was that I had said that there were seven reports, that there were live sighting reports dealing with a possible facility underground. I never said it was a prison. I said that's what the site, that's what some of the reports said. But obviously, if there's an underground facility, it could be a prison. The reaction to both Mr. DeStott and Mr. Cito to my questioning, and to my comments, very, and I use the term arrogant, manner, almost uh, in a way condescending to this senator, was that I was full of garbage because there couldn't possibly be anything because the water table was too high. Now, that's what you said, and it was very clear what the intent of what you said was. And I'm telling you on the record right now, that as a base on the results of my intelligence data, that there is an underground. If, if I could add. And, and if you don't know that, then maybe you better go no, no, check I, it out. We're very much aware of that. Okay. Uh, then let's get that you know, record straight. It, well, is there I, or is there just, not a facility underground? There, there is an, an underground space there that apparently contains generating and other equipment that relates to the mausoleum. Is that a prison? I think not. But nonetheless, the point that, is, that you can't those... have a generator underground, Bob, without without having a facility under there. And in spite of the water table, it's I there. I think if we can, if I can interject here, because I think we need. I just to get sick on. and tired, Mr. Chairman, of this kind of this kind of this kind of testimony. I it's think... counterproductive. Excuse me a second. It's counterproductive, and it is not fair to 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 present this kind of testimony to this committee. And it's misleading. It's inaccurate. It's misleading, and it's deliberate. And I, 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 I've never said this publicly, but I'll say it because I frankly don't care anymore. I was given access under the Ho Chi Minh tomb by a Vietnamese mm -hmm. official who was scared to death that he was going to be executed because he let me in there. So we got in and Kerry was in there with me. So he knows damn well what I'm talking mm -hmm. about. He went in and this guy said, you cannot divulge, if I take you under the tomb, you cannot divulge that you went in there. So we agreed to do that. So we never mentioned it. I didn't mention it in, this, in the committee that I was under there, neither did Terry. He and I were the only ones that knew other than two staff people. So we went under the tomb and there was a tremendous system under there of tunnels and huge air vents and pipes and water pipe i mean you name it it was looked like a, a, a subway system under there and it was built by the russian now in the exchange i had with the stott i asked the stott trying to knowing what i knew he didn't know i was under there so i said to the stott i said well we have a lot of live sighting reports of people saying they saw prisoners american prisoners in tunnels underneath the ho chi minh tomb and you can find this if you look it up i don't know where it is but it's in there somewhere he said, to me, he said to me, well, if you were it, anybody under there would need an aqua lung because you'd have to swim because it's all underwater. And he laughed. And I sat back and I just kind of I, I, I couldn't say anything. I couldn't say, mm -hmm. well, I was under there and I know you're a liar. But he was lying right there on the spot, lying to me. And what they did, and this is important, very important to the system. They debunked every one of those live sighting reports because you could because they said there was no tunnel system. There were no tunnels mm. under there. There were no there was no access under the Ho Chi Minh tomb. There was no infrastructure under there. Therefore, there, nobody could see POWs under there because it didn't exist. And I can show you in report after report after report where they debunked witnesses and called them liars. They called them fabricators. Yeah, thank you. They call them fabricators because they they, they couldn't see. Uh, a prisoner where there was no such place to see. That's what they did. And that was just one example where I know this thought lied and, uh, and we could prove it, but I couldn't say anything. Yeah. I think he also mentioned you'd have to get a, or you could go check with an engineer or something to the effect about having tunnels under there or something. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was elaborate. I mean, I've been, you know, you've been in, if you think about a subway system or maybe you're down in the bowels of an old, building almost like under the u.s capitol there were all those pipes and right. that's what it looked like it was a network mm -hmm. and there were rooms and doors and huge huge pipes i mean big big around as a oak tree i mean huge pipes big uh and everywhere 
and, and rooms and a very elaborate, clean network all under the tomb, behind the tomb and under the tomb. And we found out from this Vietnamese official that the Russians built it. I, I said to him, I said, where did this come from? The Russians built it, he said. Well, who knows? You know? well. The other one, there was, and, and of course, John knows about this, and I think you all do too. Pilots had uh, pilot identifier numbers. And the only people that knew who what that number was was the pilot, were the pilot, were the pilots, and somebody in the U.S. government high up in the in the intelligence community. So if they were shot down, and they they wanted to pass a message to the satellites above, they would take, they would they write that number in a way with sticks, perhaps rocks, uh, anything that would look natural, maybe shrubs, uh, to so the satellite can view it from the top and, and they'd know that that person was there and they'd know it wasn't fake because the only person that had that number was the pilot himself. No one else had it, not his colleagues, nobody. So we had a case and I don't, I don't have the name. And if I did, I, I don't think I'd want to make it public because of privacy. I'm going to just make up a number. I'm just going to say 2792. It's a made up number. And I'm going to say the pilot's name was Jones. Just make that up. John Jones, okay? And this is what happened. True story. We got a report in the in these files that the DIA had that said that, that there was a pilot named John Jones missing. His identifier number was 2792. And on the ground was near a prison in Viet North Vietnam was the number 2792. Now, I... I did not take that on its face value. Dino and I went over to the intelligence agency and I said, I want to see the satellite image of those of that, those rocks and sticks mm -hmm. that spelled out 2792. I want to see it. They said, well, you can't see it. And I said, I want to see it. I'm not leaving here until you show me it. So they finally, they had a huddle and they came out and they finally dragged it out. And so I look at it and I see 2792. I mean, it's not like somebody wrote it perfectly, but you can sure tell it's a two and it's a seven and it's a nine and it's a, and it's a two and it's sticks and stones arranged in a field in a not, in very discreetly in a corner, not out in the middle of the field where everybody, did, but in the corner discreetly, we could see it. So I turned to the DIA debriefer and I said, we got a pilot missing. That's his number. That's his name. That name goes with that number. How can you say this is not real? He said, I don't see any number there. I said, what? He said, I don't see any number there, Senator. You don't see 2792. And you're looking at that same thing. You don't see it. No, sir. So this is all true. So I, Dino and I left. I came back. And somebody had told us that there was a guy that used to work there at, the, at doing that imagery study. He's now retired. He was an independent contractor. I can't recall. He's deceased now, but I can't remember his name either. But anyway, we got a hold of him and we brought him into my office. And I said, I want you to look at something. I'm not going to give you any information. All I want you to do is travel with me and with Dino over to the DIA. I want you to look at a map and tell me what you see. That's it. I'm not going to tell you another thing. He said, well, I can't do it for nothing. I said, how much you want? He said, a thousand dollars. So Dino and I raised the thousand dollars, not from the government, out of our own pockets, and we gave it to him. He said, "Okay, you're, I'm hired and I'm going." So away we go. So we go over, and they drag out the map, and they did not want to do it when they saw this guy because they know he worked there. So they took the same map out, and I, I, they roll it out on the table, and I said, "What do you see?" And he says, two seven nine two. It's like, and. And the guy, uh, and so I turned to the DIA guy, the, the, the analyst, the, the image guy, and I said, what do you see? He said, I don't see anything. I see a bunch of sticks. And so the guy that we hired said, what? Are you kidding me? I used to work here. You can't blow that smoke over me. And the guy said, well, I'm telling you, I don't see it. So that's where that came down. And I wanted that to be investigated further. Harry refused to do it. So I don't know. Here again, when you talk about one of the questions you asked me was, can, why did we say we had proof but we couldn't establish? How do you? Where do you go from there? I mean, how yeah. 
What's true? Right. I mean, how much more information? Can, I mean, I just don't get it. And if you had said to me, 2792, we didn't have a pilot missing with that number. We didn't have a pilot who's with that name and that number. I'd say, okay, fine. It was a mistake. Okay, I'll tell you. But we had all of the, all of the above. Click, 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 click. All click. And yet, no. We, we, and we were not allowed to pursue it. I was stopped. I couldn't do it. I want to jump back a minute because we, we brushed over a lot of good information. Uh, <laughs> when you were talking about the, the authenticator codes and stuff like that, that, were, that we know were, were real. Um, did you, do you remember one that was brought up about uh, a 52 being put on the ground? Um, the walking so, gate? Yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah. Yes, I do. Uh, some of those, I, they could very well be true. The only thing I would say there, John, is that I didn't, uh, they were, they were um, witnesses who said uh, they saw this uh, and we did have some imagery on it. But they weren't as credible. I'm not saying they weren't credible, but I'm just saying they were not as credible as the one that I just referred to, where all the all the bullets were put together and all the pieces fit to make it, you know, the perfect. But yes, we had the walking K, which is was another way to identify, but it's not walking K is not as exact as an identifier number, but it was it was certainly uh, very credible. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, what was interesting about that, there was actually a, about that time a, a major with the, the Royal Lao Army that was being held prisoner there at, the, at that camp. And uh, he uh, had provided intelligence, well, he was actually an intelligence major uh, with the Royal Lao Army. And he provided statements to the DIA and, and, and stuff about Americans being held there and being trans and then being moved to a different camp and you know back and forth between a couple different camps and that that information never came out no. yeah I was going to go back to these cluster maps because we never really got into them very much and you're talking about how they were destroyed by the by the committee and and stuff can you talk to us about how important those cluster maps were to you um, you know how it uh, integrated all the all the signal intelligence all the human intelligence everything was combined into those cluster maps and how important they were? Well, I, I think they were very important, uh, John, because when you look at, when you when you go into this issue, um, you know, you, you try to peer in from the outside and look at all the stuff that's going on. And as you just correctly said, you had, you had human intelligence, you had signal intelligence, you had, you know, eyewitness, you, you had all these, you had comments from the, C the DIA, you had comments from the North Vietnamese, you had North Vietnamese Arvins, you had captured North Vietnamese soldiers, I'm sorry, what, South Vietnamese Arvins and captured North Vietnamese. You got all this information, Garwood, all of it, and it's spread all over the, the, uh, the government, it's spread all over the place. So these guys on the committee that did the, the, the my staff, that I hired every one of those people uh, who all had a certain amount of talent in this area. And uh, I personally interviewed most of them. And they uh, were very good. And they they would just simply take, there were literally thousands of live sighting reports. Some of them were pure garbage, just people trying to get out, refugees who were trying to get a, a way to get into the country. Uh, and, and, and we were able to uh, throw those out and, and, and take we started with the map by putting everything. Anytime somebody said they saw somebody at point A, we put point A there and we put a pin in and let that cluster build, 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 not trying to discriminate or dif differentiate between where they came from or what they were. Then after we got that done, we then zeroed in on the garbage stuff, pulled that out and, and were able to just narrow it down to legitimate clusters. Um, and so, but, but Terry, his attitude and McCain was we just needed to focus on one person at a time and and one sighting at a time or one POW at a time rather than looking at the whole picture and you can get a picture uh, you know if a hundred people see somebody at a location if a hundred people say they saw a POW and one people person says they saw a POW there's a big difference in terms of the credibility for obvious reasons so that's why the clusters were important. But they immediately, the Terry and his staff, Francis Winnick, 
They never gave us a chance. They, the, 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 the presentation was, was laughed at, mocked. And then all of that data, all of those maps, all those charts, all that classified information, all of it, and unclassified, some of it, destroyed. And how they got away with it, I don't know. I, I, guess, I, I tried to, to, to get something done about it. Couldn't do it. Well, wasn't it true in almost every instance in those cluster maps when you started adding in the, uh, the signal intercepts and the alleged distress signals that they all correlated to those clusters? Yes, they did. Not not all of them, but for the most part, yes, because we took everything. Uh, you know, I don't think the I, I could be wrong, but I don't believe, uh, for example, the Baron 52 is in the cluster because that was a little bit later. So, yeah, it's not an absolute. But but, you know, the the uh, by doing that, it was a very telling story. It was shocking uh, because I kept saying, I want to see the cluster. I want to see the cluster. And the guys kept telling me, no. No, just stay, stay back, Senator. Let us let us get finished and then show it to you. And when I came in that room and they showed me those clusters, I mean, it, I was shocked. I, I was literally shocked. Uh, and then I took some of the better uh, reports, such as Garwood, uh, the, the, the 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 pilot identifier number that I talked about, and the and the the, the Nam uh, Namarat. Uh, raid, which we didn't talk about. We don't need to go into that. But when I put all that together, that's where the clusters were. The clusters were where Garwood said he saw them. The clusters were where Namarat raid was supposed to take place. The clusters were everywhere that we had significant live sighting and or intelligence reports. Uh, and then when you compare those clusters with the debunks, I have to say that a lot of the debunks were legitimate. They were liars. They were deep reefer. They were, but many of them were not. And we took out the bad stuff and left only the good stuff in the presentation. We were honest about it. We took the, the garbage and we threw it out. We didn't try to, you know, rig the system and make the cluster look like that when it should look like that. We didn't. We didn't do any of that. We tried to be honest. We tried to be fair. And the reward we got for it was. They destroyed all the evidence and refused to even consider it and indeed laughed at it and mocked it. It was an effort made to uh, a coordinated effort by Zwinig at the committee, Francis Zwinig and John Kerry. And they would, when they, they made me, when I had questions other than what developed in a kind of an ad lib situation, which I had a lot of, but they wanted to know what my line of questioning was going to be. And I had to submit it to Kerry. And she took that information and gave it to the DIA when they, before they testified. So my attitude on that is we're investigating them. We're not working with them. We're trying to find out what the hell happened. Why are we giving them our questions? They gave them all the questions they asked. And then they gave them, they tried to give them everything I asked. So a lot of times I just held stuff back and just, and that's why I ad lib because I wasn't damned if I was going to tell them uh, everything. So I could at least get, that's why that exchange that I had with the spot was, was pretty testy because he was lying. And I knew he was lying. He knew I knew he was lying. He knew I had done my homework, but he didn't know because I didn't tell Terry everything I was going to go into. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Baron 52 MIA mystery podcast. Join us on our next episode as we dive deeper into the Senate Select Committee hearings and the outcomes. Thank you for listening. Above our land Flags so proudly hail